on course right now in Lagos from the rubble of that collapsed 21 story building that you saw just before this uh, segment began. And to have a conversation on that with us this morning is Emeka Okoronkwa, who is an estate surveyor and valuer as well as a certified realtor. Thanks for joining us this morning. The question that is on the minds of many people now is how no. could we see this coming? It's Ikoyi, it's highbrow. Did you see this coming? Good morning, and thank you for having me over. First of all, I'll join every Nigerian to commiserate for the people that lost their lives and for the people that are going through all series of things at this moment, just like people in my institution are also concerned about it. Um, it's a shame that it happened. Could it have been avoided? Yes, it could have been avoided. Unfortunately, it just did happen. But I think there is also a moment to seize here. It's a time for us to be very diligent and critical in understanding what happened so that we can be able to forestall this kind of calamity ever happening again, especially in Ikoya and anywhere that it is in the country. But it's very unfortunate. Well, digging into the issues now, I mean, of course, there are the all facts are shaky right now. So many things are uncertain as to exactly what happened. And a number of people, a number of information flying all over the place on the internet as concerning whether or not this was certified. The Lagos State government has come out to say, okay, it was supposed to be a limited number of uh, floors, and then it took it way ahead, and then this happened. I'm wondering, from your experience, what could have been the reason for this? Okay, you see, let's understand it properly. You know, Napoleon said that where they are in the country of the ignorant, the amateurs become teachers. Let's understand exactly how this thing happens. In construction, there are different kinds of failure. There's construction failure, there's services failure, there's design failure, there is maintenance failure. What happened there was construction failure, period. Now, if you want to be able to analyze and understand it, people that are very suited for this kind of job are people that we call forensic engineers. For the purposes of a good conversation, it's just a reverse engineering what happened so that you can be able to establish where the faults were. And construction sites are similar to the a theater where doctors um, operate on people. The processes are such that they overlap. So if you go back to it, you can be able to identify where lapses occur and what could have happened. So life is an irony. What would have happened? The only thing that causes that, this kind of uh, problem in construction is either where there is faulty stability, or there is lack of integrity, integrity in the construction materials, right? If there is failure, just like human character, when people are weak in character, they say that they, uh, they have no integrity. If construction materials are weak, they say they lack integrity to carry. Houses have what is called the dead load and then the imposed load. So constantly they are carrying loads. So two things would have happened there. It's either the materials were compromised or the competence of the people that calculated the load, because these loads are supposed to be distributed, so that they follow the vector lines until it is transferred to the, to the base, which is the foundation that transfers the load down. So anywhere you see misalignment in terms of the strength of the construction materials or stability failure construction um, will collapse in this manner. So this is exactly what would have For us to be able to underpin and know what happened, we need a forensic. And that forensic is a walkthrough of what would have happened. And that will entail all the people that are in the construction team. That will entail the clerk of site. That will entail the people that receive the materials at the site. Detailing the kind of material that they received at the different periods of construction. Whether they were in compliance with what the regulatory 
um, demands were at the time. So this way we'll be able to know so that we don't just... Um, well, Mr. Kuroko, I, I, I mean, I don't understand the language of construction, but from what we have seen, what you have also seen on the screen as the program went on, it, it would, I mean, forgive me for making this sound like a like it's a little trivial, it was like just slices of bread packed on the ground. It's, it's not like the whole thing was contorted like all in a, a heap of rubble or anything. It's like packs of the floors just stacked upon one another. I mean, I have never seen a, a collapsed building like that. Well, you know, Ayo, the, the best thing to do, so that because we are professionals, it's nice that we disseminate information that is credible, and it's also people's livelihoods, people's investments, people's all of that in line. So let's be factual. Let's do the right thing. Let's do a walkthrough. Let's have competent people go through this forensic. That way, we can be able to better advise government, in the, because this should actually call for more regulatory changes, policy changes, OK? This should call for a lot much more policing of what is going on. And the truth is that so many of these houses are actually deficient. It's just some of them are not at the danger level where lives are involved. But some of them are costing the people who live there so much money because of all these defects. Which one? The, the already existing houses or the, the ones that are being constructed? Both. Timberland, oh. both. But, it's just, um, you know, these kind of things, of course, you know, it's not the first. Uh, that it happens. So I think part of the point that I was trying to make is in areas where you thought that they will stick to the standards that they should know better, yet we have these kind of things. But even as we speak, I mean, there are several developments going on in different parts of the country, uh, realtors, you know, like yourself, people are building, they're selling directly to would-be buyers. So what needs to change specifically when you say regulation a lot needs to change because i know that several groups professional bodies like yours they have meetings they rob minds when these kind of things happen with a view to saying look how do we ensure these things don't repeat itself what are those things that you think should change such that this don't happen again okay i mean thank you so much this is such a pointed question to the heart of the issue um you know, since this thing happened yesterday, there have been so many people have called me, there has just been so much in the space. But let me use an analogy that we can both relate to. And I'm sure that a lot of Nigerians remember what used to happen in the pharmaceutical industry, where there were the businessmen that would bring the drugs. And then at one point, there were patent medicine shops. Citizens were uh, could walk into a patent medicine shop and buy drugs. Mm -hmm. And then the consequences on society were enormous. People were dying. There was no regulation. There was no standardizations and all that. That is exactly what is going on here. There should be a buffer. Somebody should be able to protect the interest of the, interest of the public that are going to utilize this construction um, buildings that are being constructed every day. We need to be able to have people that are under oath to protect citizens, to ensure that standards are followed, so that at the end of the day, the end users of all these buildings are safe first, and then buy or stay in buildings that are comply that comply completely with the regulations. If these things are not done, the gap is just way too much. I mean, an unsuspecting person will actually go to any house, and how will you understand whether these things have been done well or not? But if you have um, if you have a qualified person that is appointed to be a go-between be between these developers, who are the best of them are all businessmen seeking for opportunities and trying to make money from the people who are going to invest and live in these places or work in these places, who at the end of the day are at risk with their lives. There has to be that in between. And unfortunately, it's lacking today. The only way, some people ask for it, but government will come into place to better regulate it. Just like today, you can't go to any pharmacy shop without seeing a pharmacist. That pharmacist is under oath to ensure that whatever it is that is administered to the patient is in compliance with the regulations of medication. So we need that to be able to come in that way 
you will be able to be a bulwark against the developers whose interest may just be to maximize and then the unsuspecting public who do not know the regulations. So at least if I tell you that I have been part of this construction and it, um, it has satisfied all the conditionalities, there is also, maybe I should explain this in a little way. You know, if um, you come to buy or take a service from me and the end of what you're going to take from me is actually a function of all of my contributory experience to you. The relationship between me and you is called a client relationship because factually you come under my professional protection. So I am obligated under oath to offer you the best of service. So, so let's take a practical example now. You call me to a construction site and say to me, help me sell these allotments or whatever. I'm under obligation to the buying public to ensure that I better police what is going on. And when I notice that it's not in compliance, I either respectfully ask that I be excused from the job and inform the authorities, or I don't take anybody there. But if I have to take you there, then I'm under obligation because you're under my professional protection to offer you the best of service. Mm -hmm. There is even a maxim in my, in my profession called the caveat M to buyer beware. How are you going to beware? It has to be people like me educating you in those things. I don't know if I yeah. balanced it a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, just give us a moment. We need to go back, uh, we'll go to that particular scene now. Uh, our correspondent, Olu Phillips, is there now. He joins us to give us some updates concerning what's going on there today. Hello, Olu. I mean, yesterday the traffic was nightmarish, uh, to say the least. So what is the current scenario at the moment? Good morning, everybody. Um, it's the morning after, and if you're still wondering if this is true, I can tell you this is true. I mean, so first of all, there are a lot of things happening around here. This is the Gerard Road, uh, popular Gerard Road that leads you on to Bodilon. And as we speak, it is shut down both sides of the traffic. And so anybody who would usually use this road to connect either to Falomo or to get back all the way to Kingsway Road, that's not going to be possible as far as this um, rescue work is concerned. Now, so you see um, from yesterday we reported that this collapsed building um, is one of the three uh, of this type of buildings um, under construction. So what you have seen is a situation where the one in front of it had caved in. And when I went in earlier, because of the um, structure of that building, uh, it all came caving like um, a pack of sandwich. And when you look at it, it takes the form of a pie. And, and that's what has happened. Officially, I'm just going to tell you what the official figures are, regardless of the numbers that are being brandished here and there. Officially, from the Nigerian Emergency Management Authority Agency, uh, we have four people confirmed dead and five have been rescued alive. Uh, but from the way the building has collapsed and has caved in, it may be difficult um, to have more rescues as it were. Uh, I'm not a prophet of doom, but um, from what I can see, the debris and the way it came caving in from the top up to the bottom, uh, it may be, big, it may be big, a big challenge uh, to find any more, uh, to find any more um, survivors as it were. But we are hopeful that um, while the excavation is going on, 24 hours after, as it were, or a few hours after, since it collapsed. Um, hopefully, maybe we should find some survivors, as it were. But rescue work has resumed very early this morning after the heavy downpour um, that, that happened early, late, late yesterday night and early the, early the hours of today. Uh, that's the situation here for now. Um, incidentally, also, there are security forces uh, from the extractions of the Nigerian military, the Nigerian police, uh, people are also wondering when I milled around to find out what's going on. People are also wondering why we have a lot of military men around. That's something we need to unravel at some point uh, because this is not usually, uh, they're not usually found at such um, sites, yes. All right, uh, thank you very much indeed, Dolu. We'll uh, keep tabs and stay on that matter as we progress here at Channels. But, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dolu, for that one. What Mr. Kron called, the, the issue you raised the other time about... Uh, coming under client protection, a client coming under your protection and all of that. Do you see that as anything that may have happened here? Because, you know, there are also suspicions in some quarters, well, 
previously, even before this one, as sometimes the, the professionals such as yourself would say, okay, this is what I advise that we do. But then the client would say, no, 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 do more or do less and all of that. Does that happen? And do you see that could have happened in this case? I mean, this is a human nature at play. It's possible that it happened. It's possible that it didn't happen. But like I said, let's be factual. Let the... Now, let me just give you a picture of what goes on in a construction site, okay? The construction site is a team comprising of an architect, a quant surveyor, civil engineer, electrical engineer. Sometimes you got a planner in it, and then you have a value, an estate surveyor like myself in it, right? Principally, the first person that we should be able to call now to say what happened here is the architect. You see, some people get all these development matter very warped, right? There are three kinds of relationships that occur in a site. Well, the developer's obligations are to the fund managers. His interest is profit. He's not under oath to protect society at all. The people that are under oath to protect society are the professionals that are under oath to offer service, the best of service to citizens, and then to protect and ensure that the, the requirements of the government are met. So these are the two angles to it. So the first people to ask questions here are the professionals. What happened at the site? Were you at the, and I saw one letter yesterday flying around. I thought it was very logical because the fundamental thing to do if you wanted to get out of this site, because if you contract with me today, I cannot go and build for you. An architect needs to bring a design that government will approve. Okay? The structural engineer needs to present drawings that government will approve. If you say that you are leaving the site, you have to inform the people that authorize you to be at the site. Government should know. And if you say you're leaving, so it's a problem for government. They need to come back there to say, okay, who's taking your place? So they know the person. Is the person competent? You don't just go and the problem shows up in less than 10 minutes, a letter flies out and to say, it's very ridiculous. But, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to speculate. I want to be factual. Let's base our findings on what we can verify. You the construction, the, the development team are there. The architect should be called now to begin to tell us what happened. Mm -hmm. And then there are records. There are meetings at site. There are people that, su uh, that supplied materials. Clerk of work would have collected those things. These details there is all part of what the forensic engineers will go through to be able to ascertain what happened. Right, because uh, one wonders, yeah. pardon me, I mean, that, that, that audacity, as it were, to... Uh, go back to work if it indeed the Lagos state government, in fact there's another publication that has been going around about the Lagos, Lagos government saying that they were trying to forestall a disaster, that's why they moved to uh, you know seal that building, in fact another letter which you also referenced about one of the contractors saying they pulled out, so a lot of questions come up and I recall listening to one of the emergency responders saying that, that that perhaps was the first day that those people were reporting to work at least that group of people were reporting to work so you wonder the audacity to you know to to show up to continue work there if indeed, indeed it had been sealed and some of the contractors had pulled out but uh, let's put this in another context so in 2014 we had a similar I mean I'm talking about big collapses now we've had pockets of smaller ones this year alone in Korodu in Lagos Island but the big ones 2014 recall that church guest house that collapsed over a hundred people died 2016 we had another one in Lekki about 34 people died as well and this one we're not sure of a casualty figure and I imagine for a lot of people staying in this kind of apartments uh, across the state and perhaps across the country thinking I hope we're not next. Which one is next? And, and that question will definitely uh, be on the minds of people. So, I mean, we don't know which is next. We don't know what went into constructing some of those buildings. What should be done by the state government authorities to maybe look around? I mean, you saw that collapse in Miami recently and how they said that there was some work meant to be done and it wasn't done. People were already staying there. So can we look around? Is that possible? And check existing buildings to ensure that this does not happen. Okay, the work of governance is a shared responsibility. Government stays at the policy angle, professionals stay at the execution angle. Everybody is a cool participant in delivering good results and experience for citizens, right? Now, we, 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 the, the government must do their job, but the professionals must also be true to duty, right? Which is also the benefit of this kind of conversation, because Citizens must also know where and where to ask questions. I'm not trying to promote our job or people in my industry, but we play a fundamental role because 
the opinion of people that understand these things count for you. You know, there's this saying that the benefit of um, low price, the danger of low quality will stay longer than the benefit of low price. It doesn't cost you anything to get a professional's opinion. Ordinarily, a lot of people, even be, be beyond all these high rises, there are so many of all these retail houses that are springing up all over Lagos. If you know the experiences that people go to in all these homes they buy, it will amaze you. There's something that is called money pit. You buy a building, you don't know that the cables are poor, you don't know the plumbing is poor, you don't know. How would you know? Because you come there, the glitz are there, they buy, they paint, the whole thing is exciting to the eyes. Or even defect um, designs. A friend of mine the other day had called me that he wanted to buy a house, and the wife loved it. I got in there and I looked at the house, and I asked him, how old are your children? And they were all thought that I said, one of them would die in this staircase if you put him there. They didn't see it. Okay. But when I mentioned it, it made sense to them. So that those who are listening, and as an investor, they are about to take a decision to go to a developer and perhaps deposit in part of a construction that is going on, perhaps with a view to further invest in it. So what is the ideal process? Should an investor have that direct contact with a developer such that you can just say, well, I'm putting my money here. I want to buy this house as it's being constructed. Answer is no, it shouldn't happen because the developer is after his interest and his profit. And you are being sold something that you have very little knowledge about the mechanics or the construction details or how the process are followed through. You need a professional opinion. And that is a no-brainer. It's just... You know, it doesn't, it, it saves you so much more than it can cost you today. You understand? So putting these things in perspective is important. And it's the role of government because citizens also want to do the least in terms of expenditure. But government must protect the citizens by all these rules. The government should now, this is a big opportunity, to ensure that no developer should sell directly to the public. Otherwise, there is no check in ensuring that you comply with the regulatory requirements. That's period. Is that saying then that, um, of course, it's also in your industry that it happens that people buy houses off plan? Is that then against the law? Yeah, people buy houses off plan, but there are technical questions to ask. For instance, there is a construction going on today opposite St. Saviour's School. Okay? The people are very professional, and they had um, come to a lot of people to ask questions. Who said the latitude of a developer or an investor, whatever you call yourself, in a construction site are in different degrees. If you're talking about the structure of the building, your, lat your latitudes of change changing anything is very limited. You should leave it to the engineers to do the best of the work that will carry the load. Then if you come to finishing, you can do that. Look at that construction. There. It's, part of, it's, a, it's a good example. Julius Baja is doing a damn good job to be able to ensure that the integrity of the house is strong, right? Now, this is the kind of thing that we offer people. If you come to buy a site, you should get an opinion from people because if we are in a site, we have an independent person there all the time attending the site meetings. That will also give us a report of what is going on. And then when we have opportunity, we cross-check it with the developer or we, if we are confused, we call the architect and say, what is going on? Because at the end of the day, the real client is not the developer. The real client is the guy who's going to end up living there. Well, th this conversation is, it sounds to me like one that is just starting, <laughs> Mr. because there are so many <laughs> conversations to have around this one. Another, yeah. another, another team of cannon folders that we can call are the people who work on the sites who cannot ascertain or confirm the quality of the materials and which are sometimes, as we have experienced, the, the, the victims of collapsed buildings such as this one. But for now, we have to thank you very much for being a part of our conversation this morning. Emika Koronkwa is an estate surveyor and valuer as well as a certified realtor. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Well, we can jump right into the emails just before we go. Uh, we've got this one from uh, Adeni, who's talking about preventing collapsed buildings or that unfortunate incident uh, which is currently making, hugging the headlines at the moment. So his mail uh, says, the agencies in charge of giving approvals for building construction need to do more than just giving approvals. Judging by the incessant collapse of buildings in this part of the world clearly shows that something is wrong with many of the contractors. As such, they must be involved in the whole process right from the foundation 
to the last stage. Well, Henry's mail is on the coming Anambra election. It says, uh, poor diagnosis leads to poor management of any ailment. Insecurity in the Southeast and perhaps the entire nation is yet to be properly diagnosed. He says, the ongoing narratives reinforce the earlier concerns uh, and uh, worsen the state of hope. Goes on to say, I neck at the eve of a presidential election in this country postponed the election to ensure better preparation. Now it is about safety of lives and property. Will it be too much of a sacrifice? I believe he's perhaps asking for a postponement. Is that, is that indeed uh, your point there, Henry? <laughs> Up to there. Well, where? Well, John Ugolo has this one and says it's a shame that in the 21st century, Nigeria is deploying massive police and military forces for security during elections. The situation further strengthens the proposition to implement electronic voting to, and transmission of results so that voters can vote from the comfort of their homes, just as financial transactions are done online. While with electronic voting, there will be no fear of insecurity and attendant low voter turnout during elections, so essentially making a case uh, for electronic voting and transmission of results. So see how that is accepted and when, when we eventually adopt that as our mode of voting. Well, thank you so much for sending in your mails and comments and being a part of the conversation this morning. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. I'm Kairi Okikele. And I'm Ayo Makine. Have a wonderful day. I'm Chamberlain, so goodbye. <laughs>